Welcome back. We've been journeying through the Bible, and we've reached a place where God brought the Israelites, the descendants of Israel, out of Egypt into the land that God promised to Abraham. He made a covenant with the people, and the people were consistently breaking that covenant. Uh, eventually, they asked for a king, and uh, after that, there was a civil war. So there's Judah in the south, Israel in the north. And God had promised King David that one of his descendants would always be king, reigning in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, forever. In the north, there's, it's just sort of a free-for-all. People kill each other to become king. But at this point, where we left off, the Assyrian Empire has been spreading, and they're a major threat. They're brutal. Their army is extremely strong. At this point, they've never lost a battle. And they want that land bridge in between Egypt and Mesopotamia. That is the land where Israel exists. Um, the Assyrians want to control that land, and they're going to do everything they can to get it and go on and take Egypt as well. So the Assyrians are on the move. Uh, when they arrive at a city, they basically say, surrender to us or we're going to torture and destroy you, and they follow through. Uh, if the city does not surrender, uh, horrible things happen, and uh, sometimes people would actually kill their own families and then kill themselves rather than fall into the hands of the Assyrians, because that would be a better fate. Uh, the Assyrians are extremely brutal. Um, everybody hates them, and they're on the way. Now, God's been sending prophets to Israel and Judah, and we've just started looking at those prophets recently. Uh, Isaiah has started prophesying, and today we're going to look at a prophet named Amos. Amos, he describes himself right in the beginning. He says, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders of Tekoa. Um, Tekoa was an area in Judah. Uh, but Amos says these visions that he had that he's writing down here concerned Israel the northern kingdom. So he's from Judah, but he's writing to the king of the northern kingdom, Israel. Now, how would somebody from Judah uh, go to the king of the north and deliver this message from the Lord? Well, he would, you know, there are ways you can establish meetings like that with the kings. Um, Amos wrote down this prophecy, but it sounds like he wrote it down long after he spoke it. He mentions an earthquake. You know, these visions he had two years after the earthquake, and it must have been some earthquake that he just says, the earthquake, and everybody who reads it knows what it, you know, oh, that, right? So uh, the earthquake, I'm sure, had a big impression on him. But he wrote this down two years after that, after he had the visions. So chances are he spoke this to the king, wrote it down later on. Well, he starts out saying, the Lord roars from Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. Uh, and from Jerusalem, he utters his voice. The shepherds pasture grounds. Uh, and the shepherds' pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Mount Carmel dries up. And then he starts speaking in this poetic language. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke its punishments. Now he's going to repeat this over and over again. That's just some fancy poetic way of um, saying here's why this judgment is coming. And he'll repeat that. All right. So the first... A little bit of this refers to Damascus. That's the capital city of Aram, which is north of Israel, one of Israel's enemies. Now, they make alliances now and then. They partner now and then to do some things, but generally they're, uh, they would consider each other enemies. And God says, I'm going to judge them. I will send fire upon the house of Hazael. Uh, it will consume the citadels of Ben-Hadad, the leaders of Aram. And he goes on describing the judgment that's coming. Uh, why did he do this? Because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Uh, next section, thus says the Lord, three transgressions of Gaza, and for four I will not revoke its punishment. They deported an entire population to deliver it up to Edom. And so God here is addressing Gaza, one of the key cities in the Philistine territory, Philistia. Right now, if you're the king of Israel, and you hear the Lord... Now, Israel, remember, at least nominally, worshipped the Lord. That was their national god. Um, they thought it was okay to have lots of other gods, where the covenant God made with them said, no, I am your god, have no other gods before me, no other gods in my presence. And they were constantly worshipping other gods. And 
the Lord will explain many of the other things that they were doing as well. But if you're this king and this country boy from some rural part of one of your enemies territories, Judah in this case, comes to you and starts saying these things, um, you know, your enemy from up north is going to be judged. Your enemy to the west of you is going to be judged. You kind of sit up and take notice. Right? Um, I kind of, in my head, I picture Amos as like Cletus from The Simpsons. He's overall a little piece of straw sticking out of his teeth and all that. Uh, um, he's saying it to the king and the king is starting to say, this guy's all right, I, I like him. Well, he continues, thus says the Lord, for tre three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. Well, Tyre, what did Tyre do? Well, they deliver. They also, like the people of Philistia, they delivered an entire population to Edom, and they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. Uh, therefore, I will judge them. I'll send fire upon the wall of the city. Then he goes on for three transgressions of Edom, and for four. Right now, Tyre is in Phoenicia, um, up north of the territory of Israel. You would have Aram to the east part there, and then Phoenicia to the west. So both of those nations are just up at the north of Israel. Well, here, Edom is down just south of Judah, uh, right under the Dead Sea area. And not an immediate threat to Israel, but definitely a threat still. And they, were, uh, they would be considered enemies. Well, for their transgressions, I will not revoke his punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword. Or that would be the combination of Judah and Israel. And God goes on to declare the judgment that's coming on Edom. And the king is smiling now. He's having a good old time with this guy. And he continues, Amos continues, For three transgressions of the sons of Ammon, and for four, the Ammonites, another direct threat to Israel. Uh, they uh, did some atrocious things. Um, God says they ripped open the pregnant woman of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. And so, and then God talks about all the judgment that's coming on them for their sin. And he continues, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, the Moabites. Uh, they're just to the east of Judah, and they would also be a threat to Israel. I will not revoke its punishments. And God talks about why and declares the judgment coming. Well, Israel and Judah started as one nation, but since the Civil War, they've been fighting this Civil War on and off for a couple hundred years, really, at this point, and uh, not the entire time straight through, but they've been at odds and at war on and off for two centuries. Well, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. And the king now is saying, ah, this, this is wonderful, right? This is the best news I could have. I didn't expect this guy from Judah to come and pronounce judgment on Judah, right? So this is great. Well, why is God going to punish Judah? Because they rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept its statutes. Their lies have led them astray, Those, the lies after which their fathers walked. So I will send fire upon Judah, and I will consume the citadels of Jerusalem. And the king is really happy with this. This is all great news for the king. But then he almost continues, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment. And the king's demeanor, I'm sure, changed at that point. The, the king of Israel was hearing all this and loving it until that moment. But now, punishment is coming on Israel. Well, why? Because they sell the righteous for money. They sell the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who pant after the very dust of the earth on the head of the helpless also turn aside the way of the humble. A man, and it will pause there, that's all. You're oppressing people, you're abusing people. Um, there were commandments in the Torah. Uh, well, first, um, a man and his father should never be sleeping with the same woman. Um, and if you take a garment from somebody, say you, t you make a, give somebody a loan and they give you their jacket in exchange for that, well, don't keep their garment with you all the time. Give it back to them at least at night so that they don't freeze to death. Right? You don't want them getting hypothermia. So that was actually one of the commandments in the law. Don't abuse the poor. Loan generously to the poor. 
and if the person gives you collateral, that's something they need to, to just to live, give it back to them when they need it. Uh, so, uh, particularly garments, um, anything that will keep you warm, don't keep that until they pay their loan back. Give it back to them uh, so that they can stay warm at night. Well, here God is saying in Israel, uh, they would, uh, remember the Israelites, people of Israel were worshiping other gods. Uh, a lot of the worship to these gods involved going up to hilltops and making sacrifice to, to their gods. Uh, with some of the gods and goddesses, you would go up on a hilltop and have sex with a temple prostitute, and that was part of worship. Well, here God says, not only are you oppressing people, you're uh, going and finding people who just, you know, they're in horrible situations and you're making it worse for them, but also a man and his father resort to the same girl. And he'd be talking about the temple prostitutes. So a man and his father are both sleeping with the same temple prostitute. And not only that, but they're doing this on garments taken as pledges. So on garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar. And in the name of their God, they drink wine, the wine of those who have been fined. So they're unjustly, unjustly fining people, using that money to buy themselves luxurious items, uh, getting drunk on wine that they buy with their abuses of power. They, uh, not only do they sleep with the same temple prostitute as, you know, father and son, but it's a, they do it by spreading out a garment that they were supposed to have given back to the person who owns it. Instead, they use that as a bed to, uh, to sleep with this prostitute on, father and son. But God is basically saying, look how utterly corrupt you are, Israel. You're pleased that I'm judging all these other nations, but let's talk about you now. And the Lord goes on. Uh, I brought you out of Egypt. I paved the way. I fought the battles. And this is what you do. You have made the Nazarites drink wine. A Nazarite was somebody who made a vow to the Lord for some certain amount of time, uh, unspecified. You know, the person would say, I'll do this for a year or six months or whatever it was. And they would set themselves apart from, uh, for the Lord. One of the things that they would do is they would avoid anything that comes from grapes. Wine, grape juice, no raisin bran, not, none of that stuff. Uh, well, you take these people who have set themselves apart for the Lord and force them to drink wine. You're forcing them to stop setting themselves apart from me. You've commanded the prophets of God to prophesy falsely or just telling them to shut up. Um, God uh, makes it very clear how he feels about these things. Well... In chapter 4, God addresses, uh, I have um, the NASB study Bible that I'm reading from, and there's a little commentary note saying that here God is referring specifically to the upper class wealthy woman, and uh, there are hints of that here. Um, but God says, hear this word, you cows of Bashan. Right, so he's talking to these wealthy women, and God calls them cows. Apparently that was just as insulting back then as it is today. But hear this, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, you who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Go now, that we may drink. The Lord has sworn by his holiness that, behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. You will go through breaches in the walls, each one straight before her, and will be cast to Harmon, declares the Lord. Well, the Assyrians, one of the brutal things they would do is when they took a city, they would take the survivors, uh, which usually would be the uh, women, uh, children, maybe the older men, uh, anybody who was not part of the army, uh, they would take them and they, they would be captives, they would be led out of their city, and they would make sure that all these people were controlled and did exactly what they were told because they took fish hooks, put them right through the person's nose, and tied it to a line that was tied to the next person with a fish hook in their nose, and the next person, and the next person. And then once everybody was all, you know, hooked up, uh, they would say, now walk. 
And if you didn't walk right in line with everybody else, it was pretty bad. So uh, God is saying that's going to happen to you. Assyria is coming to take over and take you captive. And those would be the ones that are lucky, that weren't just tortured and killed. Uh, well, why does God do this? And Amos, um, he mentions this several times through his book. You oppress the poor, you crush the needy. God had already alluded to it once here in the book of Amos, does it again. And this is a theme that comes up uh, throughout the book of Amos. But not just Amos. If you had to summarize the messages of all of the prophets, all the written prophets, there are a couple prophecies or prophets' writings that are just really focused on one specific thing, but the bigger prophets and the ones who really talk about the plight of Israel and Judah and get into the reasons for it, the two main themes that come up over and over again, one, they have left the Lord, they've forsaken the Lord, and they've served other gods, and two, they have oppressed the poor, they've abused the needy, they have ceased to care for the widows and the orphans, but instead just take the little bit that they have for themselves. Uh, these are the things that keep coming up. Um, and these things are all written in the Torah. They're commandments that are part of the Torah. And there are many other reasons that God is judging the people, and uh, God gives those other reasons throughout the prophets, but these are the ones that come up over and over and over. You have left the Lord and served other gods. You have oppressed the poor. You've oppressed the needy. You've um, Anybody who's in need, you just abuse them instead of helping them. And God keeps calling them to turn back from that, to practice justice and seek justice. But instead, God says, you're not doing that. You have not returned to me. I warned you and you haven't turned back. I've warned you again. You haven't turned back. Um, Therefore, I will do this to you, O Israel, be, uh, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. And that's not a uh, nice, hopeful sense there. It's not, hey, I'm coming to visit, prepare to meet me. It's, oh no, it's prepare to meet your maker. Um, Amos continually calls the Israelites, the, the nation of Israel, to repent. Um, Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. The people were looking forward to this thing that we've talked about called the day of the Lord. A day when God will overthrow all his enemies and then reestablish Israel, um, make peace in the world. And God says here, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, what good will it be for you? That will be a day of darkness, not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion and a bear meets him. Right now, lions, you, you pretty much, if a lion attacks, you pretty much, that, that's it for you. Um, there are three people I'm aware of in scripture who fought off a lion. Uh, Samuel, uh, I'm sorry, not Samuel, um, Samson, the judge who did it by God's supernatural strength. Uh, King David and one of King David's mighty men. Uh, beyond that, if a lion attacks, pretty much you're dead. And here Amos is saying, you're, you're, on the day of the Lord, you're going to be like somebody who is attacked by a lion and actually escapes, only to be mauled by a bear on your way home. Or you get away from the bear also, and then you finally get home and lean against your wall and a snake bites you. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? And then God lays into their religion, their religious practices. I hate, I reject your festivals. I do not delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I do not listen to the sound of your harps. I can't stand your church music. I can't stand the songs you sing to me. I despise them. I despise your church services. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. Instead, take those things away from me, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And ultimately, that's what God wants. Later on again, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the humble 
of the land and pronounces more judgment on those people. Those who cheat with dishonest scales, it will come about in that day. I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. You're going to be judged for the way you treat these people. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, but not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Uh, you're not going to hear my voice anymore, God says. But then, after all this, Amos ends this book with a little glimmer of hope. In that day, speaking of the day of the Lord, once all this vengeance and judgment is poured out, in that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David. Uh, booth is like a tent or a dwelling place. I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its branches. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, right? in all the glory uh, that it used to have. Um, it goes on to say, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. There will be a remnant of people that I'll preserve and I'll restore them to Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They'll make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord. And that's the way Amos aim, uh, ends his book, uh, scathing declarations of judgment on God's people, ending with this little glimmer of hope and constant calls to repentance. God doesn't want to judge these people, but he says, look what you're doing. If I don't judge you, I'm not just. Uh, I don't want to judge you, so turn back. But unless you do, here's what's coming. Roughly the same time, probably a little bit after Amos, another prophet named Hosea uh, starts um, hearing from God. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take for yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant, flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. Now, I have a suspicion here, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that Hosea, many of the prophets were very, very close to the Lord, and I, I suspect that Hosea said, God, what is it like to be you? Like, you know, you can't possibly like what's happening here. What is it? What does it feel like for you? What is, um, what is your life like? What do you think of us? And he really, I think, genuinely wanted to know this. And I think the Lord kind of said, if you really want to know, I'll show you. Go find for yourself a wife of harlotry. Find somebody who you know will be completely unfaithful to you. When the Lord had spoken this, said, Go take for yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. So he went and took Gomer. He said, Oh, I know just the woman. And he went and married Gomer. So she conceived after they were married and bore him a son. The Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel for a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Well, he marries Gomer, this woman he knows will be unfaithful, and he ends up really loving her. And Gomer, uh, they, right after their marriage, she conceived, she bore him a son. Well, that phrase is really important. She bore him a son. The, and remember, God said, a woman who, who will be unfaithful to you, a woman of harlotry. So after this, Gomer conceived again, and gave birth to a daughter. Notice it's not bore him a daughter, it's gave birth to a daughter. The Lord said to him, Name her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. So name this girl No Compassion. But then she conceived again and gave birth to a son. 
And remember, it's not like the first time she bore him a son. It's not that. It's she gave birth to a son. And it's an important difference. The Lord said this time, Nahum lo ami, which means not my people. Name this son that your wife bore to you, not mine. Right? She's been cheating on him. She's been sleeping with other men and bearing children by other men. And uh, the Lord says, this is representing what the people have done to me. They are not my people. Right? Um, just like the son, uh, Hosea, is not your son, these people are not my people. And um, then the woman leaves him, and uh, Gomer leaves him, and basically uh, she's, it's a little bit uh, unclear whether she goes and marries somebody else or just becomes a prostitute again. But God tells Hosea, go and find her and buy her back to be your wife again. This would have bothered Hosea not just because you know, she cheated on him repeatedly and then ran off, and you're telling me to do what, God? It's more than that. It's that Hosea loved the Lord. And in the Lord's covenant that God made with Israel, that, that Hosea would have been trying to keep, God says, if a woman commits adultery, both the woman and the man she's with will be stoned to death. Not only that, but the Lord said, if a man and a woman split, and the woman is with another man, then she can never go back and remarry the first husband. God here sees that Gomer has cheated on Hosea, and then she's run off and she's with another man. And God says, break those two parts of my covenant. Break the Torah. Instead of having her stoned, buy her back. And instead of rejecting her because she's been with another man, take her back and remarry her. And that must have been shocking, not just to Hosea, but to all the people who watched Hosea do this. And they'd be saying, Hosea, you know what Gomer's like. You know what she's done to you. She's probably going to do it again. Why would you be with her? And Hosea would always answer that question the same way. This is what you have done to the Lord, Israel. Um, Israel, you are doing the exact same thing. And yet the Lord wants you back, just like I want Gomer back. So that's uh, the gist of the book of Hosea. And uh, we'll be talking about some of the other prophets, and we'll get back into some of the narrative and see what's happening as Assyria is moving closer and closer to Israel.